Hi, we continue in the second half of the so-called Tower of Babel story in chapter 11 in the book of Genesis, verses 5 to 9, as you can see on the left side of the screen. On the right side of the screen, as we looked at last time, we can see two different ways this story is structured. One is a chiasm, as you see in the top part of the right part of the screen with the red framing and A and then um, the other colors that shape that. But today I really want to focus on the parallel panels at the bottom and the fact that we looked at the first part, uh, verses 1 to 4, and now we're looking at the second part. But note that the second part of the chiasm does not include, or the second part of the parallel panels rather, does not include verse 5, which we are going to start with today. The parallels start with verse 6 and go through verse 9, and you can see um, the parallels and themes. But one of the things that's very interesting, I think, about uh, the second half of this is there's no exchange between the people and Yahweh. In previous stories in Genesis, where there's some kind of uh, transgression by humans, usually there's uh, been some, in fact, there's always been so far, some uh, contact between Yahweh and the people about it, and some sense of exactly what the people did wrong. For example, in the Garden of Eden, uh, God comes in the cool of the evening and walks amongst them and asks them explicitly, did you eat from the tree which I told you not to? And of course they did. And then there, the language of curse comes. So we hear very specifically that curse comes because of disobedience. Obedience. With Cain, uh, after he's warned that sin is crouching at the door, then kills his brother, then Yahweh still comes to talk to him, and it's his brother's blood that cries out from the ground, testifying against Cain. And so Yahweh sentences Cain to be a, a restless wanderer, but puts a mark on him to protect him. So in both those situations, we see there's a very clear transgression by the human beings, either disobeying a commandment or the obvious transgression of murdering one's brother. And similarly, in the flood story, as we've seen, in the flood videos, there's a lot of language of uh, ethical opprobrium. Just for instance, consider these words here. We see two different words for e Hebrew words for evil in 6.5 in the preface. And then uh, after the announcement about Noah, uh, the narrator returns to note twice that the earth is corrupt um, and then twice that the earth was filled with violence. So it's corruption, violence, and evil that's named there, and that's what leads to the flood, which as we saw before, actually did not result in any change in human behavior or human's relationship with God, but God gave new conditions for the relationship between humans and each other and humans and other animals. Here, though, it's very different. Not only is there no communication, it's not at all clear um, what the people did that's so bad, if they did anything bad. It's also not clear what God is concerned about, and there's no apparent relationship between whatever God is concerned about in verse 6, the proposal to respond in verse 7, and what actually happens in verse 8. Um, so um, many things going on here that make this, as we saw last time, a much more complex story than is often seen. We are working our way through some of these uh, issues, and you see uh, there's 14 there. Uh, the others above that were looked at last time, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I'm going to focus on the ones that I'll discuss here uh, and looking at the second part of this, starting there in, verse, in uh, issue number 9. So we looked last time a little bit at the question of whether we're to see this as a Mesopotamian ziggurat. And as Sherman notes, who I uh, showed last time, his doctoral dissertation turned into a book which challenges um, all the traditional scholarly views to provide evidence that supports their viewpoint. And as he notes, many scholars just assume there's a ziggurat here, even though there's nothing that describes it that way. For example, a ziggurat is a stepped pyramid, and all we hear is this is a migdal, a tower. And as we looked at last time, migdals can take many different forms, and a ziggurat's only one. Also, there's nothing about worship or gods in the first part. There's nothing that the people were seeking divine protection or support for their city-building project. Uh, there's no mention of gods at all, whether it's Yahweh or Elohim or Marduk or anything else. So there's no reason to think that this tower has a, the kind of religious function, which to say a link between the divine and the human that the Mesopotamian ziggurat um, would provide. So we need to put that aside, while not putting aside that there's something about the Babylonian world that's at issue here, rather obviously, because because this is in the plain of Shinar, which is, of course, in the area where the Babylonian Empire was. And in the end, um, the city is called Babel, which is just another name for Babylon. So uh, in the verse, in the themes that follow here, we're going to look at the question of what exactly is Yahweh's concern. Um, we, I already mentioned a little bit about the Garden of Eden, but we'll say something more about that in a minute. And then those other issues down there, 12 to 14, uh, about uh, confusing their language. And then finally, the relationship between the builder's desire there and what will follow in chapter 12. So let's, let's have the biblical text up on the screen here so we can follow some of the Hebrew and the word plays that we see along the way. <laughs> 
So uh, if I just scroll up just a couple of verses, we see that the last words from the people were, let's make a name for ourselves, lest we, or otherwise, as we see here, be scattered abroad upon the face uh, of the whole earth. And so now we see the Yahweh comes down. I'll restore this back to where we were, that Yahweh came down to see. Um, and that can be read a number of ways. It can be read as a satire, that this tower, which is purported to be so high, is so small from Yahweh's perspective that Yahweh can't see it from there and needs to come down. Um, plainly, we can't be expected to take this literally, that Yahweh has eyesight problems or can't see very far. So at some level, it's a, a comedic element here, um, whether that's a satire on, on the Babylonian project, uh, external to the story in, in our text here, or just to the story within. Um, but Yahweh comes down. As a number of scholars have noted too, this is a, a standard form of Yahweh um, interacting with hum, human beings in a Yahwistic perspective. And what Yahweh is coming down to see is the city and the tower, which human beings had made, immortals described here. But it's Bene Aha Adam, the sons of Adam here. And as you can see from my note in the lower left, only used one other time in the entire Pentateuch, but many times in the Psalms and writing this phrase, uh, sons of Adam, to refer to human beings. Um, but it's interesting that many scholars just take the text for granted and don't consider what other options Yahweh might have or what it is that Yahweh is choosing to do. Came down to see the city and the tower, not to engage with the humans, not to question their motives, not to challenge them directly, but just to see it. Uh, and yet, when we see what follows in verse 6, there's nothing about whatever Yahweh saw that seems to be evident in Yahweh's verbal response in verse 6 and 7 and the action response in verse 8. Um, there isn't, there's no description of the city and the tower as too big or evil or filled with violence or corrupt or anything about it at all. We know nothing about this um, abstract city and tower other than that they're in the plain of Shinar and that the tower was completed and the city is not completed. So Yahweh comes down to see this and then uh, we hear that this is said here. And uh, my note below notes that again, not, Yahweh says nothing about directly, the city, uh, directly about the city or tower, but reverse the initial situation in verse 1, as if this was a res verse 6 was a response directly to verse 1. And that's where the parallel panel aspect um, helps us to understand this. So Yahweh said, and as is the case often in uh, this part of Genesis, um, it's not clear who it's being spoken to. There's uh, no naming here of uh, other uh, beings of any kind, but in verse 7, you can see there's a plural us. So similarly like us in chapter 1, we can't give an answer to that, whether that's royal we, uh, royal us, um, or the heavenly court like angels and cherubim. It's certainly not intended as many Christians misread it later as the Trinity, because certainly the Genesis authors knew nothing about the, the post-biblical notion of a divine Trinity. Uh, so whoever that is, the authors aren't concerned about who Yahweh is saying that to, and says, look, and the word for look hen is a variation of henna, uh, behold, as we've seen. And it, it took place both in the Garden of Eden story and after the, the Cain story to note that it's God having a moment of wait, 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 wait. Um, uh, or we might say, wait, what? Um, so uh, look, they are one people and they have only one language. But let's look more closely at that. And we can do that with the Hebrew um, as well here on the, on the right side of the screen. So, in, in, Hen and indeed here, they are one people and one language, and this is only the what of they will do. This, the New Revised has beginning here, um, but the, the word hachilem um, here doesn't necessarily mean beginning in that sense. It can mean any kind of first. And so, let's look at a couple of examples of that. In 426, we see um, at that time, people began to invoke the name of Yahweh, which is to say um, they started a new process. Here in 6.1, uh, we also see here people began to multiply on the face of the ground. So, it suggests uh, the first of something, and the primeval history uh, is all about firsts of things because it's the first human beings. But this is very nonspecific because if Yahweh was looking at the tower and the city and now commenting on the fact that they have one language, what is it exactly that Yahweh is concerned this is the beginning of? And uh, more city building, bigger towers, bigger cities? Uh, it's not clear at all. Uh, an entire empire? If so, that's not named. 
Um, what they will do is literally what they will make, la'asat here, and that's important because it comes up again in the verse. And it contrasts with what God was making uh, in Genesis 1, of course, and what humans are proposing to make here. But unlike the Nimrod counter-creation in chapter 10, verse 10, which starts with Rashid, that sense of beginning, and is plainly described as being in Yahweh's face, lifne Yahweh in the Hebrew, um, and this is not in Yahweh's face. There's no sense that they're concerned with Yahweh one way or another. Um, and so uh, the people who are the builders are not seeing themselves as rivals to Yahweh, at least not in what we gain from the text. So it's not clear, again, what Yahweh is concerned. This is the beginning of exactly what that they will make. And the rest of the phrase does not make it any clearer. The New Revised Standard has nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Again, uh, let's look more closely at some of the words here. So the word proposed to do literally think to make. And we can see that down here in the Hebrew, translated here in the interlinear as they devise. But basically, any plans that they might make. So, any plans they might make, and notice the double negative, um, will be um, nothing will be impossible. So, why is God speaking this double negative? Why not say everything is possible? And note how this echoes, as we see in my note down below, uh, the question of after they've eaten from the tree of life, the question of eating from the tree of knowledge, which leads them to be expelled from the Garden of Eden. Um, but here, it's not specific. There, it was very clear that the issue was eating from the tree of life. And here, what it is that Yahweh imagines that people will plan to make isn't clear at all. Um, but why is God concerned about that? Should human beings not be making things? Um, this making is not, again, said to be in opposition to God or in service of other gods. The traditional means of, of Yahweh's concern in the Bible, uh, that they're not being exclusively loyal to Yahweh, or in a later context, not following the covenant. Uh, but again, there's nothing about what they feel for proposing that suggests any violation of any law, let alone anything like sin. And if so, why doesn't God tell them so and give them a chance to, to change their mind? But that's not what happens. Instead, uh, we hear this in verse 7, uh, Yahweh's proposal here, um, and come, and Hava here is a come, and we see it, uh, uh, this is the third time here in this scene, and it's a number of other times as we can see in Genesis. Let us go down, and notice that they've already, they've already proposed to come down, and had come down, so it clearly is a metaphor for uh, uh, God doing something and engaging in the situation, um, not going down a second time. So let us go down and literally mix their language. The word balal here um, means mix and is usually used for like making flowers. You can see from my note below. Um, so like oil and water or flour and oil. Um, so not about languages. Let's go down and mix their language so they will not understand or literally not hear. Uh, they will not hear one another's uh, language or lip here. Um, but what does that have to do with the city and the tower. And what does that have to do with uh, making uh, the impo nothing is impossible, making that possible, which is to say, uh, preventing them from doing anything that they want to do, uh, other than the fact that they would speak different languages. Uh, and obviously, the Israelites knew very well how to speak different languages, whether that's the language of the Babylonians, Akkadian, or the languages that eventually became the language of Jerusalem, of uh, the Persian language of Aramaic, or the later language of Greek, and certainly the much later language of Latin. So there's been no sense then or now um, that different languages do anything but pr put some kind of impediment that can be breached. It's certainly not a permanent barrier to have different languages, and anybody who's multilinguistic certainly knows that. Um, but what would that have to do with the city and the tower uh, isn't at all clear. And it becomes even worse in verse 8. So we hear the outcome here, and, and the so here is va and, so it follows as one sentence. They will not hear one another's speech, and Yahweh scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. But notice that it said Yahweh proposed to doing two things, to mix their languages so they will not understand, uh, I'm sorry, that Yahweh proposed to mix their languages. But what instead happens is they're scattered. Um, and uh, many scholars have taken the scattering is the key that to make this a part of uh, resistance to the initial call in uh, chapter 1 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But as I noted around the use of this term in chapter 10, um, scattering is not the same as spreading. It's a different word, um, although it certainly results in the same outcome, that the people are spread over the face of the earth. So from that perspective, there's simply a matter of people hesitating to go out and then like a parent pushing them to go outside and play or go out and form their own life or go out and get a job or whatever that might be, rather than just staying at home and doing nothing. 
But they weren't doing nothing, they were building. So as we reach the end of the story, there's so much confusion. Um, and if we were to imagine that their languages were confused, which the text doesn't say actually happened, uh, what would that be like for the people to experience that? And we hear nothing about that. We, we do hear in verse 9 that it says Yahweh confused the language of all the earth, um, but uh, it hadn't said that as the follow-up uh, from the proposal to do that in verse 7. The narrator's follow-up is that they were scattered. So they are scattered, and we hear the, again the face of the earth, and we saw of all the earth, and we saw that from the voice of the people in verse 4, and they left off building the city, or they ceased building the city, which, again, as I noted last time, highlights that the classic image from Bruegel or others of the Tower of Babel in ruins is not from this story, but from the imagination of artists and interpreters, because the tower was completed, and there's no sense that uh, God did anything to destroy the tower or the city, uh, but that the city building project was abandoned. Um, and uh, as Jacques Ellul says, or is this Jacques Ellul? Actually, it's, it's uh, Croato, uh, Latin American liberation theologian in my note below. He says, in effect, the construction of a city is a never-ending project, though not so the construction of a tower. In the process, the tower acquires a special prominence. It remains there, quote-unquote, lost in the setting of the plain in Shinar. And as near Jacques says, what they have lost in the affair is the meaning of the city they were building. And the meaning of the city is the very name of Alul's book where he comments on the role of cities in the primeval history in Genesis, starting with Cain's building of the city in chapter 4. Um, so they leave off building a city, and the narrator has this follow-up. Um, Therefore, here I'll can, following it from other etymologies, uh, it, and presumably the city here, but literally it's her name, uh, Kara Shema, her name was called Babel. And many scholars have noted that there's no reason not to call this Babylon here. Um, the word in Hebrew that's often translated as the city of Babylon is uh, Babylon, and this is also what connects it to the Nimrod story, as we saw last time, where many scholars, ancient and more recent, want to connect these two and say that Nimrod was the builder of Babel, but this story in chapter 11 certainly doesn't say that, even though chapter 10 does. Uh, and so we just have to live with the fact that the biblical authors were not worried about ambiguity or, or paradox in the stories they wrote, but just allow readers to read these. And we see that as evidence in the Midrash, where they're often willing to let different rabbinical views stand without trying to resolve those, the way a much later Platonic Christianity, um, with as the famous uh, theologian David Tracy titled one of his book, A Blessed Rage for Order, uh, talks about the need of Christianity Christianity to create systematic theology and doctrines and procedures to everything in precise power and control. But the Israelites were not about that, at least not in general, uh, other than folks who controlled the Jerusalem temple, and that's not where we're at here. Um, so they're willing to let the ambiguity stand. So here's where we see the word play. It was called Babel, and let's look at it here in the Hebrew so we can see it more specifically. It was called Babel because there Yahweh balal, or confused, or um, not the same word for mix that we saw earlier, uh, the language of all the earth. So balal here. Um, and, and from there, the last there we see here, uh, Yahweh scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So uh, Yahweh scattered them abroad here over the face of the earth, and here again it says scattered them abroad, making this into um, a little mini chiasm, or at least an inclusio. And so in the end, they, uh, their languages are confused. Uh, and of course, as we read this in English, it's a, it's a play on words in a triple level, because in Hebrew, Balal is confused. Uh, in Akkadian, Babel, at least in common etymologies, is understood as gate of the gods, although scholars argue about whether that was an official etymology or just one popular on the streets, um, as found in archaeological remains. But of course, in English, we have B-A-B-B-L-E to Babel, which is to say to speak incoherently, especially like a child, uh, which may be an image of what being seen here. Because as I showed last time with the, um, the uh, driftwood built up on, on the beach uh, and the ranger taking it down, whether it's bricks in the plain of Shinar or logs on the beach or Legos or building blocks on, the, on your living room carpet, children like to pile things up and people like to build and like to be remembered for what we've done. In this case, there's no condemnation of that, 
Um, but the call comes from Yahweh. However, it's manifest here. We don't know exactly what Yahweh did to scatter them abroad. Uh, that's a mystery that I'm not even going to address. You know, what happens to force these people to leave the plain of Shinar and go elsewhere? But that is the outcome, and it will lead to another genealogy which sets us into this transition from this primeval history into the stories of the named ancestors Abram and Sarah. We'll get to that next time. See you then. Bye-bye.